Allied forces trained more than 400,000 pilots for World War II. And after the recruits developed basic flying skills in airplanes like Stearman's and Tiger Moss, those who were destined to go on and fly fighters were going to transfer to an airplane like this, the T-6 Texan. Today, like the recruits did more than 70 years ago, I'm going to get the chance to take controls of this T-6. And if I do well enough, I'm going to have a chance next time to fly the most recognized fighter from World War II, a P-51 Mustang. For his T-6 training, Curtis is at Stallion 51 in Kissimmee, Florida. Stallion is most famously known as the home of dual-seat TF-51's Crazy Horse and Crazy Horse 2, as well as being the place for P-51 maintenance. Although he may want to, Curtis doesn't get to jump in and take the controls of the Mustang. Just like a recruit in World War II, he has to face the T-6 Texan. Instructing Curtis will be 4,000-hour Texan pilot, Steve Larimore. So Steve, at Stallion, you guys have a very carefully prepared syllabus that you use to teach the T-6. How does that compare to the kind of training the military would have given somebody that they were trying to transition into a P-51 or P-47? This is very similar to what they're getting. It's a, a syllabus-driven training program. Right? Everybody has to complete the syllabus, each thing. They have to do it properly. We brief before the flight, even orientation flights, and we debrief after the flight. It's a learning experience, very similar to what the military, military does today. Now, I can't really speak to what they were doing in World War II, but that's where those procedures were established in World War II. Like recruits in World War II, Curtis has a lot of experience in tailwheel aircraft. In fact, of his 1,000 hours as a pilot, more than 800 hours have been in tailwheel aircraft. With Curtis's experience, Steve has decided that he'll be going straight to the front cockpit for today's flight. But before he straps himself in, Curtis attends ground school to brief for the day's flight. Safety's our priority here. You're gonna see me suggest and do things to reduce the risk. Two, we know you're gonna learn something today about the Texan, and three, we're gonna have some fun doing it. And this is your flight, I don't do much hands-on stuff, I'm following you through. Consider me a coach. My ego is not so large that I have to show you what I can do in the Texan. As an advanced trainer, the Texan was a lot of students' first introduction to more complex aircraft systems, like retractable landing gear. Complex airplane. You've got to learn how to control the prop, controllable pitch prop. Landing gear, you have to remember the landing gear in the first place, how to operate it. Landing gear speeds. So it's not that more complicated than airplane, except for those three systems and the canopy. After being briefed on the systems of the aircraft and the plan for the day's flight, it's time for Curtis to head out and see the T-6. Okay. The first thing we do with the Texan is we want to make sure the mags are off and the mixture is back, because we're going to pull that prop through on our way around the airplane. Now we're going to walk around the airplane. I always grab the horizontal here, because I just want to make sure it's firmly attached. Now you can't see the flaps, but what I want to mention to you is there's three different sections of the flap. Given time, the hydraulic pressure tends to leak off and the flap will start to droop. Some airplanes are a lot worse than others. Walking around here, I always make sure the cowling is on there securely. All these cowlings, you know, they don't make them anymore. They're all patched. You see a lot of patches on them. They're not new, they're 60 years old. If you can find a new cowling, call me. <laughs> With their pre-flight complete, it's finally time for Curtis to strap into the Texan. And I'm gonna signal him that we're ready to go. Okay. Okay, go ahead and hit the starter. Starter now. Throughout the flight, Steve will be coaching yep. Curtis. Okay, now mags to both. He expects him to make mistakes, and when he does, he'll correct him. Yeah, release it now, take your prop forward. Too much throttle, you hear that backfire? Yeah, I did. Now, try to beat. This is all part of making sure Curtis learns to fly the Texan properly. Okay, everything's looking good to me. I'm gonna call ground. Charlie Alpha, hold short of 3-3, Texan 5-1. Take your stick forward and pull to the hold short line, and there you go. Once they're cleared for takeoff, Curtis takes the Texan out onto the runway, being careful to line it up with the center line before starting to bring up the power. 
Release the brakes, go to 36 inches, and keep it straight, my friend. Once the tail's coming up, I teach people to add a little bit of back pressure at that point and feel for the lift, and it'll take off when it's ready. Back pressure, easy. Positive rate, and gear up. Start doing your S turn. After takeoff, Steve has Curtis move to a practice area where they'll be conducting the majority of the flight. As we're climbing out, we're going to be doing quick reversals. These serve a couple of purposes. Get used to the bank, get used to the rudder pressure necessary, and clear the airspace in front of you at the same time. Head traffic off the link. Head three to the Charlie Alpha. Two Charlie Alpha, turn across, one follow the arrow traffic off your left. What a sweet feeling control system. Holy Pretty nice, throat. huh? I told you you'd like it. I can't believe how light it is. This is a great big airplane. With one hand, I can just roll it, roll it around the sky. That's why people fall in love with it. When they reach the practice area, Curtis completes a couple of steep turns before Steve decides it's time to show Curtis the stall characteristics of the Texan. Decelerate about one mile an hour per second. There's absolutely no warning that this airplane is getting ready to stall, and that's what I'm trying to teach you, get you familiar with the picture, the feel of the airplane. When it does go, we'll have pulled the power back to 20 inches. We like to keep a little bit of power on, and then we're going to stall the airplane. Be ready for a right wing drop. It always does when it's clean. Now, How's that rate doing? Is it OK? You're doing great. You're going to feel a little instability, and then there a There it is. Don't push. One common misconception among non-pilots is the idea that an aircraft stall is the same as a car, meaning the engine quits. This isn't true. For an aircraft, a stall simply means that the wing is suddenly producing very little lift. This occurs when the aircraft exceeds what's called the critical angle of attack, and the airflow detaches from the trailing edge of the wing. With the Texan's characteristic right wing drop, Steve also teaches Curtis to do a rolling stall recovery. You don't have to push it off. OK, so we're looking clear right. Clear right. Pull till it breaks. Pull, pull, pull. Unload hold it. Unload it. Woohoo! As the flight continues, Steve takes yeah, Curtis through a number of aerobatic maneuvers. Put your right wing down, straight down toward the ground. Wing overs. Yeehaw! This is incredible. A barrel roll. Roll to Yeehaw. those roads. An aileron roll. And loops. I wonder what those people down below are thinking. They should be jealous. They are. But the Texans here to prepare him for the Mustang. His big test is landing the T-6. The, the Texan is challenging enough on landing that the Air Force, the Army Air Force knew, and the Navy, that if they could get through the Texan program, they were going to be just fine in a, a frontline fighter, like a Mustang or a P-47 or something like that. And that's the key. You know? It can't be easy. Okay, where do we're you want way it? high. I'm going to give you a full flap. OK. Slam dunk. Look at that approach. Holy crow. Line it up. We're going to land about halfway down. How's it looking for you? Looking great. Gears down, two greens, mixtures forward, props forward. Keep your nose down for about 110 miles an hour for now. OK. This is yeah. a steep approach. Yeah, well, you can do that with full flaps in a Texan. That's what I wanted to show you. Now, don't get it in the backfire range. Just above the backfire okay. range. There you go. There's 105. OK, now start easing your nose up, not too soon. Let, okay. it, let it settle in. You got your hand on the throttle. We're a little high. OK. Ease the power back. Hold that attitude and ease the power back. Ease the power back. You're on the ground. OK, ease the power all the way back. And keep it straight as you bring the tail down. This is the critical place. I'll say it is. Nice job. I keep feel like I'm waiting for it to do something. It's, it's going to do something. It's pretty well behaved. Well, that's because you kept it straight. <laughs> I think I need one of these. That's what I'm pretty sure. I'm afraid that the problem with this is, is it's like the first, uh, it's like a first free ride in anything. You go for a test drive and you need to buy the car. What an amazing airplane. It's such an effortless aerobat. It looks like this big heavy hulk in the sky and with a little good coaching, it just rolls through the air like it's very happy to do so. He did great. He did great. He's got good technique. He was an easy student. For somebody who's never done acro, he did great.
It looks like Curtis has gotten Steve's seal of approval and he's passed the big test of landing the aircraft safely. Just like the recruit 70 years ago, now he's moving up to a fighter. Next week on The Aviators, Curtis continues his training and takes to the controls of the P-51. But unlike a recruit in World War II, Curtis has an instructor with him, the highest time P-51 pilot in history, Lee Lauderback. Will Curtis wash out or will he go home a successful P-51 pilot? Tune in next time on The Aviators.